Okie dokie Hastings, this is all the stuff you've asked me whether it's running into me in the grocery store, messaging me on Facebook, or shooting me an email. This is all the questions that you've had. So let's get started with some Cooking 101. This first recipe is what got this whole episode started. I had someone message me through Facebook saying, how do you make scrambled eggs so they're not dry? And then a few days later, I had another person ask me about scrambled eggs and it not being the right texture. So I'm gonna show you how I make scrambled eggs. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I actually have some bacon here. And what I've done is I have two slices of bacon, but I actually cut it in half. I just find it's a little bit easier for what I'm about to do when I have the bacon cut in half. Plus it's gonna fit into my frying pan a little bit easier. I don't really like it myself when that bacon is flopping over the edges. So you can start with a ridiculously hot pan if you want to, um, but what I like to do, I think the bacon crisps up a little better, I'm more of a crispy bacon person, is if I start with the heat on pretty much almost non-existent and I start to ramp it up once I get it into my pan. So while my bacon's starting to cook, I'm gonna get the rest of my scrambled eggs ready. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm an egg and a half person and other people in my family are egg and a half people. So I usually do my eggs in clumps of three or batches. Batches sounds a little bit more delightful than clumps. That doesn't sound very yummy. So I've got one egg in there. I've got two eggs in there. Some people like to crack them into a separate bowl first to make sure you don't get any shells in there. Because I'm starting with my eggs, it's no big deal. If a little piece of shell falls in there, I can see it and I can pick it out because nothing else is in there. The easiest way, in my opinion, to get this all incorporated and mixed together is to do this with a fork. So I'm gonna pop my yolks first because that's gonna require less whisking then. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to spin my fork in one spot. I don't need to worry about working my way around the bowl. If I just do kind of an up, down, up, down, up, down like this, then I know I've got it coming together. And what I wanna do is I wanna mix it so that it is all one consistent color. If you have some dark yellow spots and you've got some clear spots, that means you're gonna get some more marbled texture when it comes to making your scrambled eggs. So now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of milk. Now this is way too much milk in here. It's not necessary at all. Basically I'm putting in there a little bit more than a teaspoon of milk. And now what I'm gonna do is mix that in there. And so I'm just gonna stir together my milk and my eggs and it's gonna get a little bit lighter in color because all of that delicious milk is mixing through with my eggs. And then I'm just gonna take and I'm gonna crack some pepper and I'm gonna crack some salt right into there. So while I've been doing this, my bacon is cooking here. So what I've done is I've taken my cooked bacon out of the pan and I have it on a piece of paper towel to get rid of all of the extra grease that's coming off. If you've ever eaten something that has fresh cooked bacon mixed into it and your mouth has felt like there's almost like a coating on the inside of it, that's because there was too much grease left on that bacon and you actually have created almost like a waterproof seal inside of your mouth. So inside of my pan, I still have some of my bacon drippings. I didn't save all of them because that would be excessive and that would make for some not so great scrambled eggs. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that flavor that I have in that pan and I'm gonna add my eggs to that pan and right away you're gonna start to hear that sizzle. Now because I'm making scrambled eggs what I want to do is I want to keep those eggs moving because scrambling them comes from that movement in there. So I'm just gonna keep gently folding them and if you want to maybe you want some bigger pieces of egg in there you could let it sit for a little bit so it might look a little deceptive because there are those tiny pieces of bacon inside of your scrambled eggs right now, and it might almost look to you like those eggs are burnt, but actually what that is is those tiny pieces of bacon. So what I'm gonna do is my eggs are almost done. I'm now gonna come in with some cheddar cheese, and I'm gonna sprinkle this all over the top. And what's nice about scrambled eggs is you decide how much you want to add to those eggs. 
This is when we're gonna wanna have it on a little bit lower of a heat because like I said, our eggs are almost totally cooked. Also, you'll notice my eggs aren't sticking to the bottom of my pan and that's happening for two reasons. Reason number one, we have those bacon drippings in there that are working as kind of an anti-stick coating. But then also I do have a good non-stick pan here that I'm working from. And by doing that, that really is gonna protect my eggs. So now you've got a choice. You can choose to eat this bacon just like this or you can do what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab a piece of bacon and I'm just gonna tear it up and sprinkle it over the top of my eggs. And this will be the very last part to flavoring up these eggs. I'm just gonna fold this bacon in here. It'll stick to my eggs. And you know what? These are pretty close to done. And now my scrambled eggs are taken care of. So we're gonna pop these onto a plate and we're ready to move on to recipe number two. Our next recipe, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm not gonna say who asked for help with any of these, because sometimes cooking is one of those things where people can get embarrassed. So I'm gonna say our next recipe is from a concerned Hastingsite, Hastidian, Hastingsidian? I don't even know what you'd call us, Hastonians? who wants help with mashed potatoes. Now I said sometimes cooking can be one of those things that makes people embarrassed if they don't know how to do a certain thing. I'm gonna own up to Hastings. I am horrible at using a vegetable peeler and mashed potatoes is something where a lot of times I'll just slowly peel away with a knife or if I have to absolutely use a vegetable peeler, I actually have a cut proof glove and that's what I'm gonna use today just because the majority of you probably do use a vegetable peeler in order to peel your potatoes. So my potatoes that I have is I just have their russet potatoes and I like those because they're ones that you'd normally use for baking if you want a sweeter mashed potato, you can't see, look how bad this peeling is. It's very choppy and I probably would have cut myself numerous times right now without my glove. But the reason I like these Idaho potatoes is because it's pretty straightforward. You know that pretty much one potato is going to be a potato a person. So if you're making mashed potatoes, for four people, you can put in four potatoes. Now, one thing that kind of makes people nervous sometimes is you'll get these little spots in the potato. And what happens is when they're peeling, or not peeling, when they're picking up those potatoes from the ground, sometimes they'll get nicked by a machine. It doesn't necessarily mean that your potato's bad. You just kind of have to be your best judge on that. But if you just start shaving that potato down and it disappears, you know you are totally fine. So, I've got my first potato peeled, not too terrible. I also don't really like potato peeling because you get like a potato-y mess from all of the pieces. But I'm just gonna go through and I'm gonna peel up all my potatoes. So I have all of my potatoes peeled. Now I'm just gonna clean up my workspace. And one thing I always wonder is do people think I just throw things on the floor? But actually there's a big trash bin next to me. So it's not like I'm making a big pile to broom up, I was gonna say sweep up later. So I'm just gonna grab all these potato skins. If I wanted to, I could have left some of the skins on the potato, uh, but my family is, or I should say some of the members of my family are not fans of having skins on the potatoes when we actually make mashed potatoes. So with this, I've got my potatoes here and I'm gonna cut them apart. Now there's a couple ways you can go about this. You can, if you want to, cut your potato into big chunks, but I like to do it a little bit differently. The first thing I do is I cut in half like this, and then I lie it flat on the flat side to make it easier, and I actually cut my potato pieces relatively small. So the reason I like to cut them up small like this is kind of twofold. What it's gonna do is the potato is gonna cook faster and I'm also going to be able to mash it up easier and that's gonna save me a little bit of time. If you're a person that likes really big chunks in your mashed potatoes, that's a personal thing, you do you. But with me, I like medium to small size chunks. If you're a person that doesn't cook mashed potatoes too super often, one of the things you're gonna notice is that as you are cooking these, your water's gonna get a white foam on the top and that's all the starch coming out of the potato. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with your potatoes, it just means that they're starting to cook. So my potatoes are cooked all the way through and the easiest way to check that is when they're still in the boiling water, you just poked them with a fork if it slides in nice and easy, you know those potatoes are totally cooked. So I'm gonna grab my potato masher and I'm just gonna come in 
and I'm gonna do some starter mashes, starter pokes. Yeah, I think starter mashes sounds a little bit better. And I'm gonna go and just do a couple rough passes. Now, in order to make some really nice creamy potatoes, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in with some milk, and this is one of those things where I really can't tell you an exact amount of milk to add. All I can tell you is you need to keep adding milk to the consistency of potato that you're looking for. One thing with it is the more you mash, obviously the creamier your potatoes are gonna get, but the same thing is true. The more milk you add, the creamier your potatoes are gonna be as well. One thing that I don't do is I don't put any salt or pepper on my mashed potatoes. The reason for that is depending on what you're going to be doing when it comes to actually serving them, it's going to impact that flavor. So if you are in a situation where you are going to be serving it with gravy, gravy has a lot more salt in it. If you are in a situation, if you have unsalted butter, you might end up being in a situation where that person would wanna add salt or possibly pepper to their potatoes. So really that's all I'm gonna do with my mash. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a little bit of butter. This is gonna make sure that your potatoes don't seize up so I've got all of that together. It's really nice and good to go. So one thing that I like to do every once in a while just to spice it up is in here, I actually have cheese curds from a local cheese curd creamery. And so I'm just gonna sprinkle those cheese curds in. And this is when I'm gonna switch from my potato masher to now using a rubber spatula. And I'm gonna fold in those pieces of cheese. And then what I'm gonna do is my pan is still warm from being on the stove top. Before I plate this up, I'm just gonna let it sit for just a moment so that cheese starts to melt in there as well. That's another reason I don't like to overly salt my potatoes because now that I'm adding cheese curds in there, that's gonna make it be a little bit saltier as well. So I'm gonna fold in this last little bit. I'm gonna let that cheese melt. We'll plate this up. And whether you're a butter person or a gravy person, these are some gosh darn good potatoes. So let's see what recipe three has in store for us. Last one is kind of a combination of two pieces. I had somebody send a question in asking about using knives, and then I had somebody send in looking for an easy salsa recipe that they could make at home. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about knives, and one thing we need to know the difference between is a flat blade and a serrated blade. So with that serrated blade, you have kind of the little teeth to it, and then with your flat blade, it's just flat. So kind of thinking about if you're more of a tool-minded person, a flathead screwdriver would be your flat blade, and then that Phillips screwdriver is more like your serrated blade because it's gonna grab into things and be more toothsome. So one thing that I have in my kitchen all the time that I use with our knives is if it's a flat blade, I'll sharpen it on this sharpening tine. And to do that, it's super simple. You just take your knife at a slight angle and you just pull down. And you don't have to do this slow. You can go quick with it. And the whole purpose of that is your knife always stays sharp, but what happens is your blade starts like this and each time you use it, you're putting a little bit of pressure on it so the knife starts curling over on itself. So what this does is by running it on there, it slowly pulls that back to that nice straight blade. So that's why it's really nice to have one of those and you can bring your knives back to life with it. So let's take these two different types of knives and we're gonna do some different cuts with them in order to make our salsa. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my tomatoes. I myself prefer to get tomatoes on the vine. I think they're a lot sweeter. I like the flavor of them. So that's where I'm gonna start with. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice the top just like this and I'm gonna use my serrated knife. It's gonna grab into my tomato and do a really nice job of giving me those nice even cuts. Now what I like to do first is I cut off the top and the bottom so I have a flat surface. And then if you notice, tomatoes have all kinds of goopity goop on the inside. So what I start by doing is I come around and I cut by the ribs of the tomato. And then what I'm able to do is pull out that flesh from the tomato. And what I do is I work my way around, cutting all of those pieces off of my tomato 
And with my salsa, I don't want it to be an overly watery salsa, if that makes sense at all. And usually that extra watery or runny consistency comes from including the inside of that tomato. So now I'm just gonna take my serrated knife again and I'm gonna come around and cut. And I really, the only thing that I have left behind are all of those seed pockets attached to that inner piece. If you don't wanna waste anything, you can come in with your finger and you can clean that off. But for this recipe, I don't need any of this, so I'm just gonna set this to the side for another recipe. Or you could just toss it to the side and add it to your compost pile. I have most of my tomato broken down like this and I have pieces that I can now cut apart relatively easily. So because I am doing salsa, I'm gonna cut this rather small. I'm gonna dice it up and I'm gonna start with the soft side of the tomato and I'm gonna cut down. And when I do that, I have my nice little diced pieces. So I'm gonna do that to those small pieces from around the ribs. And now with these larger pieces, I'm going to start by julienning them. And then I'm gonna come the other direction and I'm gonna cut nice and slow, cutting into those nice little dices, just like that. Because the skin of the tomato sometimes holds it together, you just wanna move your fingers around a bit so that those pieces break apart as you drop them into the bowl. So one more time, I'm gonna take it on the soft side. I'm gonna cut thin little strips just like this, cutting nice and slow so I don't cut myself on my nice sharp knives. And I'm gonna pull it back and pull it back. One thing if when you're shopping for your knives, you can look for a knife that's called a tomato knife. My knife set, if you've ever watched some aprons optional before, is lots of different colors. And my tomato knife, just for maybe simplicity's sake, what they've done is they've made it red so that you know it's a tomato knife. So the next thing that we're gonna work on is our onion. And we're gonna use a red onion for this. I'm gonna start by taking my newly sharpened knife and I'm gonna split this in half. And red onions uh, are a little bit sweeter and that's what makes them nicer for this salsa. And with this onion, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off the top just like so so I can expose some of these ribs. And I'm actually gonna peel off that very outer layer. It's usually pretty thin. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my knife and what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna go all the way to the very back of the onion. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make little slits down because this is gonna help. And the reason it's gonna help is because what it's gonna do is it's gonna make my dicing go oh so very much faster. So now I'm just gonna come through and I'm gonna make nice, little dices and I'm gonna use kind of the structure of the onion to get my nice little pieces. So when I do this, it's gonna look like I've just got some rings. And so now all I need to do is just take and start crumbling this apart and I've got my nice little pieces of diced onion. So now I'm just gonna take these pieces and just for good measure, sometimes what I like to do is kind of a safety net. I just bring my knife through. Now notice, I'm rocking my knife like this. Most of these flat edged knives are gonna have this shape to it where I'm gonna keep the front on the board and I'm gonna work my way across and then I can go through this really nice and quickly and get a really nice fine dice. If you wanted to, you could just put this into a food processor and you'd get the same results, but sometimes when you've already got that knife out and already in use for your tomatoes, it's not necessary. So now I'm just gonna take that half of an onion and add it to my four tomatoes, just like so. For the next one, we're gonna pull out the big guns because this is something that makes salsa delicious, but if you're not prepared for it, uh, you can get a little surprise later. So we're gonna add a jalapeno pepper, but when I cut up my jalapeno peppers, I usually wear just disposable kitchen gloves. And because I like things colorful, mine are blue. Uh, and a lot of times if you pick them up at the store, you can just get them in just white. And so I'm gonna cut off the ends of my jalapeno and then what I'm gonna do is simply half my jalapeno. Now, if you are a person that thinks, no, I can't put the jalapenos in the salsa, it's just way too spicy, all of the heat of a jalapeno 
comes from two places. The first place it comes from is the seeds, and the second place that it comes from is this rib that runs through here. And there's actually an oil that's in there that makes kind of that spiciness all happen. It has a big fancy science name, but I don't know the big fancy science name for it. I saw it one time in a food documentary. Yeah, I watched those, and it didn't stick with me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come in and I'm gonna cut off the majority of that rib. I'm also gonna take my gloved hands and I'm gonna pick out all of those seeds. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the flat side of my knife that is not the sharp side and I'm just gonna push all of the pieces that I don't want off to the edge, making sure that I don't get any of that mixed back in. So I'm gonna take my gloved hand again, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna clean out the center of my jalapeno and get rid of those seeds. If it's easier for you, you can break down the jalapeno into more manageable size pieces. I'm gonna get rid of some of these seeds and some of these ribs. And then I'm gonna clear this out. I kinda call this making a jalapeno Minnesota mild because a lot of people in Minnesota don't like spicier things. But this really is one of those things where you'd be surprised how many things you might eat that have jalapeno in them but they've just been more thoroughly cleaned. If you want to make this salsa spicier, you most definitely can leave more of that rib in there. But I'm just kinda really simplifying this, really cleaning it down. So it's not something that I have to worry about. Anybody could enjoy this salsa. Sometimes too, if you put too much of a good thing in there or too much heat from those seeds, it ends up making it not be super great. So I've got these nice and cleaned and what I'm gonna do is just like I did with my tomato, I'm gonna cut these into thin strips and now I am using a paring knife. This is a smaller piece of produce so I don't want a big giant knife like I used earlier. And now I'm just gonna come through and give these a nice fine dice. And just like when I was chopping up my tomatoes, I'm gonna come in from the soft side because it's gonna be much easier to cut through the flesh of the jalapeno than it would be to cut through the skin side of the jalapeno. The skin is designed to protect that jalapeno, so it's a little bit thicker to cut through. And you sometimes, if your knife isn't super sharp, can end up being in a situation where it makes kind of a raggedy jaggedy cut. With doing four tomatoes, I think that one jalapeno is fine, but if you wanna clear out the ribs, clear out the seeds, and you want a little bit more of that jalapeno flavor, you could most definitely go with more. This is just the way that we like this salsa. And what's nice is this is a really good salsa for, to put with chips. It's a really easy salsa if you're a person that makes burritos or if you make your own tacos at home. This is pretty phenomenal on all of that. So we're gonna scoop up our jalapenos. And because I've got a gloved hand, I'm gonna start mixing this all together. And one thing that I like to do as well is I've got a little bit of that jalapeno oil on my finger, so it brings, or on my glove rather, so it brings a little bit more flavor into that salsa. So now I'm going to take off my left glove. I'm gonna take off my right glove, and now we're gonna chop up our cilantro. So cilantro, when you buy it at the grocery store, you've got a very hefty stem, and then you also have the leaves coming off at the top. You wanna use basically the cilantro plant until it gets to the point where you get more of a snap when you break off the plant. So what I like to do is just do a gentle pull, and then you'll get the most flavorful parts. So if I were going to grab this whole bundle from the grocery store that I purchased, I just usually take my hands and pull to get rid of those big stems because I just want my leaves because that's where I'm gonna have that cilantro flavor. Now, not everybody likes cilantro. You may think that it tastes a little soapy uh, and that is totally understandable because some people genetically do taste soap when they eat cilantro. So it's best if you've never tried it before to try just a little bit in your salsa before you get yourself up and running. So I have here in front of me my cilantro leaves. I'm just gonna bring this through and I'm gonna go with that same rocking system that I did before where I'm gonna make my little pile and I'm just gonna come through and I'm gonna cut up my cilantro into nice little manageable pieces. And we have that all taken care of, so I'm just gonna sprinkle it on the top. With this, there's no exact amount. With me, I just do a loose handful like I just did. 
And my very last piece to start getting some of my liquid in there is I'm gonna add some lime juice. I'm gonna get my limes prepped before I actually cut them. So to do that, I'm gonna take my hand and I'm gonna gently push and I'm gonna roll my lime because what that does is it starts juicing it. There we go. Then I'm gonna cut it in half and I'm just gonna take it and I'm gonna squeeze it through my fingers. You shouldn't have too much of an issue in there with having seeds, but just in case if you get some of that loose flesh in there that comes out. So we're gonna start with one lime and now I'm gonna stir this all together. Then one thing with all of these flavors together in here that you are most certainly gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna crack some salt into there. If not, you're going to get kind of a separation of flavors. If you put that salt in there, what it's gonna do is it's gonna make it feel more like one cohesive mixture all together. And that's really a super easy salsa that doesn't take much time at all once you've perfected your knife cuts. So three dishes, let's see what this weird assortment looks like. I will say this is probably the weirdest assortment of foods that we've ever had, but it's also pretty delicious. So we have our perfectly fluffy and flavorful scrambled eggs. We have our really easy twist on mashed potatoes, cheesing them up a little bit at the end. And then we have our perfect knife cut salsa. So all of these things, well, you wouldn't necessarily eat them all together. You could have part of your breakfast, maybe some of your lunch, and a little bit of your dinner. So remember, keep those questions coming because I love answering them. And always remember, the apron's optional, but the flavor isn't. So now what I've got here is I have most of my potato. potato. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna 